Next piece on the block is the crosshead, and this is the only drawing you have of the crosshead. It's the crosshead, the connecting rod, and the piston all shown in an assembly view, and you kind of diagnose what you need from there. This is how it's provided. The thickness is finished cast, so that's nice. You don't have to mess around with that. It does give you a lug on the outside, so you can turn it to the 5 8 diameter, and that is the diameter that slides nicely up and down inside the standard. So if you don't want this thing knocking around, or binding make sure that you have a nice fit there there are two of them naturally and first operation uh, before I just grab a hold of this and turn this I will give it a full inspection I'll check this to see how round it is it's supposed to be 250 and you can see we have a parting line on that both sides both pieces so my first operation may be a vertical operation in the mill and a back bore so I can establish a central finished lug on here so I can then turn it and spin this off and end up with equal lands on either side. Not every detail counts because somebody's always watching. Anyway, that's the chore. Let's get to it. The only thing we needed to do to prep these for the lathe was some very gentle filing on the OD to take any of the protrusions off. And the parting line in the center is actually, over the, over the parting line, it's actually the same dimension as the opposed diagonals on the round features. So that's why this one looks a little bit different than this one. This one was more aggressively filed than that one. But we're going to put this in the lathe now and turn the end journal true to the front. And then we're going to flip it around, do this, and turn the OD and drill it and tap the hole in it. Then over to the mill for the final features. And that part is done. This is a relatively simple one. With a part this small and irregular geometry of the OD, I think it's important that you wiggle it and you seat it until you're pleased. Watch the split lines in the collets and just feel the part as you close the collet. Moving it back and forth, linear up and down. And sooner or later, you're going to come to a place where you're pleased. Quick visual check, let you know how close you're running. And when you turn this diameter, turn this diameter to a nominal size so when you flip it, you don't have any problem gripping it with the collets you may have on hand. If the initial step cooperated, then the OD should clean up just nice and all the lands should be relatively symmetrical when you're done. Give myself about a thousandth clearance here between the OD of this part and the ID of the standard. Moving on to the drilling operation, this will be a 540 thread. It's a uh, 125 OD, about a 3 millimeter, almost exactly a 3 millimeter metric thread. But it's imperial to match the modification to the rod that goes in here. Using a two flute high speed steel 540 tap, I'm going to go about a quarter of an inch deep.
I'm going to do the cross hole operation in a collet block because there's really no other surfaces to trust. I can trust the OD and the face, but the clocking orientation, there's nothing there that you can use. So I'm just going to set it up in the same collet that I used to turn the OD. Make sure the center is true and flat and lock it down. Once I bump it up in the machine against the end of the part, I'll use an indicator to sweep the part and an edge finder to find the location of the hole. Let's tighten it up, move over to the mill. Now this is something you won't see me do very often, but I'm going to plunge a two-foot end mill across that because I know that the tapped hole in the end of the part is interfering with that hole that was the plan. I tapped it all the way through to the far side of the through-hole feature. And I just want to make sure I have a nice transition for the reamer. The end mill will pass through this part without the influence that a drill would uh, demonstrate if the hole has an interruption in it. The end mill will plunge through and still give you a vertical straight hole without walking off center. This part will now go back to the lathe locating on this diameter and be brought to the overall length. And that should finish the part. I may add a small counter bore in the front uh, for concentricity. I don't like locating on a thread. And that may be the next step. We'll see. One of the final steps in the procedure is to put a small counter bore in the face of this to help with concentricity of the rod that connects through to the piston. Uh, do not trust the threads for concentricity. There will be a shoulder on that rod, so it will be perpendicular, but that doesn't mean it's going to be concentric. So we're going to put a small counter bore in there to assure that that uh, at least gets closer. Let's flip it around, remove the tab on the back side, parts finished. For this operation, I will take an initial facing pass. I remove the part from the machine and measure it. That's what I'm doing now off camera, put it back in. Once I make contact with the part ever so slightly, you'll see a witness here. There you go. I know exactly how much I need to take off, and I can bring the part to finish length without any further removal of the part from the machine. Now, instead of turning that whole thing down, it's always nice to have some material laying around for a bushing or a nut or a collar. So I'm going to park that slug off and throw it in the chip bin. Not the chip bin, the spare material bin I have. And use it at a later date. Why not? And there you go, completed crosshead. I'll take some of the burrs off of it and we'll test fit it on the connecting rod and inside the standard where it goes. Okay, if everything has gone well, this is what you're going to end up with at the end of the day or end of the week or however long it takes. The little counter bore on the end is my addition to the formula. I just don't trust threads for concentricity. And this is the rod that goes in there.
So now I have a guaranteed concentric relationship between that crosshead slide and this rod. And instead of single pointing the threads on the end of this rod, I drilled and tapped it and put a stud in here and then just cut the stud off. If you think about how this assembly is going together, you've got brass threads on this side and steel threads on this side. So if something's going to fail, chances are the brass threads are going to pull out long before the steel threads pull out. So that is a very safe way to do that. That is also the way that the retaining pin is going to be made that secures these guys. For now I'm just going to use a gauge pin. Come on. There you go. A little reciprocal motion is so that the cross head stays straight in the cylinder as the crank is going around. Allows it to oscillate. That's the thread on one side. And this will this will do just fine. This little guy right here will be great. I... <laughs> Mr. Compressor checking in at the end of the day. Thank you very much for stopping by. Timing is incredible with that thing. Now if all goes well, I can put this on here. Put it through this guy that you saw me make a little while ago. And then drop this down through the standard and everything should move freely. Should, let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah, baby. Now, if there is an issue with concentricity, naturally the farther away from the intersecting center lines you are, the easier it will function. So if you're going to see any interference, you're going to see it up here real close to the gland, and there is nothing there. That is just so sweet. There you go, take a Japanese puzzle out of this. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed what you just saw. This is a relatively simple piece as far as uh, geometry is concerned. It is a piece that took a little bit of finesse back and forth, but at the end of the day, it all went well. I am checking more and more pieces off the build here, and I am just thrilled we're getting close to the end. You know, this is a really solid idea it's a good way if you don't want to use a die if you have available screws lock tight that in so nothing pulls out or vibrates free and as far as the drive feature for the connecting rod when this is installed you're going to have to tighten it up somehow so it doesn't unloosen itself <laughs> yeah i said it so i'm going to put a flat across it so i can use a small screwdriver drive it in lock tight it down be done with it There you go. It is poor clock, and I mean poor clock. Two more pieces checked off the list wherever you are in the world. I hope you're well and happy and safe. All of the above. Me, I am Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Thank you for spending some of your time with me. I'm out.
Hey guys, I thought I would throw a quick video together, a quick segment anyway, on how the wrist pin is going to be handled for the connecting rod and the crosshead. This is the pin right here. And as you can see, it has a hex drive feature in it. It's a real easy fix. Gave myself a collar. Put it in the screw. This end of the collar closest to the head has a little counterbore relief in it for any imperfections or non-threaded sections of the cap screw. Once the cap screw is cinched tight into this little collar, I then turn the head of the cap screw down to match the diameter. And now I have a wrist pin with a hex drive in it. Naturally the thread length needs to be adjusted. But that's no big deal. And there you go.